you were in so many of the places in the world where there was trouble. Absolutely. Where do you see the trouble now? You know, you talk about tra Taiwan and you talk about Iran and you talk, where do you see the trouble coming from? Fragmentation of governments, of uh, sort of like a, the world, sort of like a hellbound train. We don't get an engineer up there. The world's growing smaller every day. The weapons of mass destruction become more accessible every day. And I can tell you, heads of the FBI and the CIA are scared to death that one of these nations are going to build themselves an atomic bomb or get a hold of a viral agent, like I was discussing earlier, and unleash it without really realizing the full implications of it. And before you know it, you may end up with uh, half the world's population gone within a 48-hour period. You know, I talked to this guy once who wrote a book about the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he, you know, he really knew everything about nuclear weapons. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Robert McNamara, who, had, uh, who has become, after the missile crisis, a nuclear abolitionist mm -hmm. because of what he learned yeah. in 1961. And I said, where do, you, you know, where do you see the trouble now? Of all the places that scare us, the Pakistan and, and, the, and, and Tehran and, and Korea, and he said, Soviet Union still, Georgia and... Absolutely. But you agree with that? I agree with I, I definitely agree with McNamara. It, it doesn't take much. you you got to remember, you, you know, there are certain safeguards in place because the government exists. The government falls. The safeguards fall. See? All of a sudden, the wall that prevented nuclear holocaust is no longer there. You know? What's, what's to stop a guy who, who, like the guy who shot on the White House, went outside the gate and shot an AK-47? What's to stop a hardliner in the Soviet Union from getting a hold of a mobile ICBM, firing it on? I still see the need for, for Star Wars. It's a, it's a defense mechanism. Now, everybody sits there and, and condemned it, but I gotta tell you, if I was sitting in Los Angeles or New York or, and, and there were missiles coming my way, I'd want that system up there, wouldn't you? Yeah. And let me tell you, it's a little too late to debate the issue when they're on their way. All right, go back 10 years Let's see, what, we, what haven't we asked him? Complicity of agents in South America, like El Salvador and Guatemala, and people that are ended up, Americans that are ended up dead in Guatemala and El Salvador, and how it turns out that they killed good, uh, where American agents are behind people that are um, not bad guys. Oh, yeah, you talk about that in your, a lot in your book about the, the writing of the manual. Mm -hmm. Casey was down in Nicaragua, right? Mm -hmm. Talking, and, and in, in Salvador, talking to the death squads, telling them to cool it. Absolutely. And their idea to cool it was to write a, a pamphlet, right? Tell me about that. Well, he wrote a pamphlet. Trying, They were trying to basically get a handle on the management. I mean, a lot of people don't understand several of the commanders, like Krill and Sosia, they were trying to kill each other at times. And Pastora, who's better known as Commander Zero. Um, these were interesting uh, gentlemen, and the Contras are interesting collection of uh, people. But we oftentimes seem to be on the opposite side. I mean, we were on the sides of the guys who were backing Washington but were killing the opposition. I, I can't comment on that. I'm not a policymaker. All I can comment on what I, is what I saw and what I did. And that's all I'm trying to do in this book. I'm trying to do with the book, The Secret Man, is really just for the guys who can't speak out for themselves. It's just their story. You know, we, we don't get a parade. We don't get medals. We don't even get a pat on the back. If we get caught, we get fried. And I don't even know what's going to happen to me as far as implication goes with, the, with this hitting the market now, whether it's a disinformation campaign or I'll be embraced. I mean, you just don't know, you know, in this kind of business. You just don't know. Have you been threatened? Oh, yeah. How? There were certain persons who didn't want to be heard, heard from, and, and they were rather sensitive to what was going on. And it wasn't, 
it was too late out after the fact anyways, because like I told you when I wrote the book, uh, I was dying at the time. So really, what were they going to do, kill me? I was already on my way out in my mind. Um, Any regrets there? I mean, you, you were writing this book as a final testament, and now you're OK. You a little worried? Yeah, I've got, I've got my concerns. I don't think it'd be foolish if I didn't. But uh, I didn't set the book out to be controversial. I didn't set it out to be a money maker or, a, or promote myself. I set it out to more or less as a catharsis, more of like, this is who I am, this is what I did, and this is the way it was. Tell me about the threats. You have your tissues there. The threats. Tell me about the guys in the cars outside your house with the guns. Um, well, I never could figure out who they were. It was just interesting. They were sitting out there with the walkie-talkies. You see the little red light. And they were rather obvious. Tell me what you found when you came home one night. Uh, I found a couple of gentlemen in my apartment uh, going over the computer. What did you say to them? Could fix you a cup of coffee. What did they say? They just walked out. Another time what was rather interesting is a little old lady who basically kind of watches this apartment complex I was living in. Chased uh, two of them away with a broom. My upstairs neighbor, or a young man, uh, observed a couple guys sitting there with guns in their lap. One night I came home with two friends of mine. Uh, we, we actually they had stopped by and uh, what we had done is uh, they came in like the back way and it was really late at night so we kind of went out a certain way and we walked around the block and when I came back I saw a guy trying to put something on my line <laughs> you know which was interesting trying to do something and we followed him out to the alley and all of a sudden three or four cars pulled up and we realized what the situation was so we backed away from it. Where do you live? Right now, I, I have residences all over. I have any one particular residence I maintain. That's another hard thing. See, you don't want us to know where you live, or? I was li living for this one. I was living uh, about five blocks from OJ when that whole situation <laughs> went down. 25 helicopters in the air waking up to it was sort of a flashback to other times, another day. But you move around a lot. I have. Did anybody call you before the book came out and when the book was in progress? I know you knew there were leaks at Simon & Schuster to say, come on, Frank, this is a code we live by. You know, you're violating everything we believe in by writing this book. You know, I didn't, I didn't get that. I did, you know, a lot of the guys I talk, talked to knew me. And they were concerned about what I was going to write. And they all kind of shook their head and said, you know what? Yeah, I, I like the way you said it. You said it for us the way we see it, in the sense of having been there. See, a lot of these books that are written, small books, are all by outsiders. So a lot of it's conjecture. A lot of it's hypotheticals. A lot of it is putting a sort of a sensational twist on it. And what I did with The Secret Man is I just wrote it from the gut. I said, this is what I was looking at. This is what I was thinking. This is what I had to do. And I think that's why it's so popular with people, because they, they always wonder about these situations, and, it, and you can read the honesty in it. All of a sudden, it, it grips you. It, it grabs you. It's like, wait a minute. This, this is a story I really haven't heard before. And then you realize the reason you haven't heard this story is because no one before has ever told it. Because there's never been a person like myself, a covert, who's ever come forward and, and written a book. Or been recognized as, as a, and had the documentation to prove it. But you said you said your favorite movie was The Godfather. But you, you, if your favorite movie is The Godfather, why was it that you said? The reason I like The Godfather is because there's a was in the sense that Michael tried to escape his destiny in the same way that my father tried to keep me from my destiny of becoming a, a covert operative like himself. My father, to give you an idea, when he left the business, I mean, he ended up working hauling doors. It was a warehouse, and we barely had money to eat. And I couldn't understand, you know, for all those years growing up, why 
who would give up such a romantic image and, and, and live in the squalor and with the hardship that, that we lived with. I mean, in high school, I had three pairs of jeans, two t-shirts, some combat boots, and tennis shoes, and that was my wardrobe, and one jacket, right? And I had to make that last a year. And I worked my way through high school, and uh, the reason I ended up doing martial arts because I just didn't have the money to do anything else. I wanted to go, I was a great football player, uh, I probably could have played pro. All the some of the kids I used to play ball with did go pro, and I was better than them. But martial arts was inexpensive, and it was available to me. And as a consequence, the interesting thing about it is my martial arts instructor Tanaka-san had been in the business, and some people say that he was insinuated into my life, so I would end up back in the business because my even though my father had left. We still, there was still a trail, and they knew that he would expose me once I was in the business to his contacts. And they wanted very much to go back to that, uh, to rekindle those resources. But now, like Michael, you, you couldn't avoid your destiny, but you kind of violated the code of Omerta, haven't you, here? Yes and no. There's many things I still play close to the chest, and I'll always, I'll take to the grave with me. Some things I just, you can't kiss and tell, you know? But the essence of the, of the secret man is the story that's never told, the story that's underneath the facts, the story that uh, motivates us to perform what we do. Nobody really bothers to ask why. Why would you do this? Why would you stay with it? Why did you do it and stay with it? Um, that's that would take me hours to to answer. It's not a a one statement kind of answer. Try. A sense of responsibility. A sense of accountability. A sense of standards that you set yourself by, and you you realize you can't run away from them. Sort of like, sort of like imagine if you one day on a lone highway and you saw someone hurt and injured. And some people, they can drive right on by. And there was many of us who, who could never live with ourselves if we saw that. Could even be an animal. And that's what motivates many of us. Okay, great. Thanks. Anything you can think of that I haven't asked you? Um, you had a friend who was in prison with Carberry's husband? Yeah. And uh, he... The rolling guy? Yeah. And... Uh, what was his name? I, I can't tell you at this yeah. time. No, but, but her husband's name. I forget his name. Oh, okay. The, the one detail that I remember um, that sticks in my mind is they... they came up with a, a new twist on torture. And what they would do is they insert a needle beneath the skin and they'd pump in like massive amounts of air and oxygen and just blow his arm up like a balloon. And uh, the guy died a grisly death. And uh, that was just the one thing my friend related to. Your friend is still in the business? Sadly, yeah. He, I think he actually tried to help him. He did everything in his power to try to save that man and others. You know, a lot of people really down the agency and say, how could you be a part of that? Well, you know what? Sometimes we have to maintain those relationships because some of these case officers can save a life or two. We can't save the whole bunch, but we can like get in there and help a few. You know, it's sort of like Schindler. He had, he had to work in concert with the Nazis, but because he was working in concert with them, he was able to save lives. He couldn't save the whole population, but he saved some. And in the same turn, that's kind of the agency. We sometimes, the agency is so misunderstood. It's a shame. Well, there are people who would say that the, the agency is not, in, is, is, is not in bed with these people 
to save a couple of lives they might save along the way, but they're in bed with these people because they support the United States government, and these people, these governments are doing whatever they want to do to s maintain their own power, but uh, and only because they m support the United States, which has happened time and time again. That may be the agency policy. I can't comment on the policy. All I can comment is on the human level. And on the human level, the reason many of these people stay and keep their contacts and do the work instead of saying I quit is because they can save lives. Because they can do, make a difference. And that's what I'm speaking of. I mean, what makes a secretary, give you an idea, work 80 hours a week in, 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 in Langley? 60, 80 hours a week. That's a grind. You know? Because she knows what she's doing is valuable. And these people have gotten hardly any recognition, chastised, underpaid. But the truth is, because of the position they're in, because of the knowledge they're in, they're armed with a sense of responsibility, a sense of, of just conscious that makes them stay. That's what holds these people to doing what they do. And it really bothers me that this guy, Aldrich Ames, has become the, the model of, the, of, a, of, a, of an agent. He is far from being the model of an agent. Because he's the underling of the agent. Let me come close. And that's what Fish was about. Fish was a bigger disaster than, than Ames, I can tell you that. And you want to end it. I helped put an end to his... his reign of terror, and I'm rather embarrassed to even talk about it. You know, all I can tell you is he wasn't working for the agency when many of these things were going on. The agent, I mean, he, the agency was far, a far cry from it. He was just trying to find a way to insinuate himself back into it. You know, because of his former power. Okay, great, great.
Can you shoot this for me? Yes. Show Thank me you. a little uh, camera action there. Well, surveillance is a very important tool in Spidem because you sometimes want to re re-record things. So what you're looking at is a looks like an ordinary watch, but as you can uh, probably tell if you look up at the monitor, you can see I'm watching you, watching me. So a little, little toy trade. All right. Do you have a camera? Let me start right here. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a camera? I have a camera. And action. Uh, I do most of my shopping when I need. I do most of my sh when I do. I do most of my shopping at the counter spy shop when I'm working now. And uh, it's one of the things that it's one of my favorite toys in the field is this uh, watch. It looks like a watch, but as you can tell, you've got a camera. Now, we're looking at the monitor. I've got a camera. So I'll hold it like there. All right? There we go. Okay, and there we go. One of the little tidbits uh, that I use in the field is this watch, which is actually a camera. so that you, you know what would be nice would be see if you right in the center of that frame with your lens, you know? Uh -huh. That would be a cool shot. Let's right through there. Right, right there? So you and me. I don't want to see me. So then you can back up and... Is that where you want it? And mm -hmm. a pan from the right camera. There? From the okay. watch up to that. All right. Okay, you want to start the watch? You have to move. Um, okay. All right, okay. And... Okay. One more time. One of the more interesting things uh, I enjoy in spy business is you have a camera, I get to have a camera. Good. Okay, another uh, important thing for securing a, a place is not only do you want to sweep it clean of bugs, but you want to make sure that nobody comes in to uh, put in bugs, and this is a valuable tool. This it looks like a clock radio, but in reality it's a, um, it, it is actually a camera. And the advantage of that is you can record uh, any intrusion without it being noticed. You can actually catch uh, anyone trying to invade your privacy uh, in the act. What you're looking at, what looks like an ordinary recorder phone, but what this is is what they call a truth phone. It's a voice stress analyzer, and you can measure the stress in a person's voice, so you can monitor a uh, someone and you covertly and you can tell whether they're telling you the truth or not. I want one of those phones. Okay. There we go. Okay, and still talking about it. What you're looking at right here is a briefcase uh, camera, hidden camera and recorder built into a uh, to a briefcase. So you can take it into situations where you need to uh, observe what's going on indiscreetly. Uh, I, I'd say um, it depends on what the jo what the job is. You know, it, it dictates often what we're using. I'd say these scramblers. It's the number one thing I use. They have an excellent uh, walkie-talkie system, for example, that you can hook up. It goes into your ear wireless. You wouldn't even know it's there. And they have uh, another set of uh, walkie-talkies that, that are encrypted, so you couldn't monitor them, and you could uh, carry on a conversation within five miles of each other. So it's very, very important. One of the things you do in, in this business, especially if you're in another country, you want to uh, get a scanner. And a lot of times you can scan even the phone lines, and you can... You can hear, let's say somebody calls up uh, a phone and says, hey, I see somebody busting into this office. Well, right then and there, you know you've been made. And you can take the necessary precautions to 